My guest today is Megan McCoy. Megan is a professor of practice and the director of the Personal Financial Planning Master's Program at Kansas State University. Her work focuses on the intersection between financial health and well being, and her research has been published in the Journal of Financial Therapy, the Journal of Financial Planning, and the Journal of Family Economic Issues, among others. She is a board member of the Financial Therapy Association. She's also a licensed marriage and family therapist and a certified financial therapist, and she holds a PhD in human development and family science from the University of Georgia. Megan, thanks so much for joining us today to share insights and wisdom about relationships and money. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for having me. <laughs> um, I'd love to just, to just first start out by learning a little bit more about your background. Like, how did you get into your field of work that intersects financial planning and couples and marriage counseling? I, I didn't know that this was a a joint hybrid field of study. would love to just learn, you know, how you found your way into this field. Yeah, it was definitely luck, honestly. <laughs> so I was, um, I finished my master's in family therapy uh, from Drexel University back in 2008 and was seeing clients. And I was like, gosh, I wish I had more tools. I wish I was a better therapist. So I went back to school for a PhD. Um, just as a side note, PhD programs are not to create better clinicians. They are created to teach you how to do research. So I was kind of like, floundering around in my first year of my PhD program, like, what am I doing? I shouldn't have signed up for this. And the financial therapy came, a conference came to town. And this wonderful practitioner named Rick Kaler did a live demonstration of financial therapy. And I was like, oh my gosh, my clients need this, but I need this. And so I went on a personal journey of getting used to money. I took uh, financial planning courses. I just put my hand to the fire for the first time in my entire life because there's actually some studies that show that mental health professionals are very money avoidant. And I was definitely that person. And so now I have a career working in a financial planning program where I really just steal what we know from the family therapy and introduce it and in how we can adapt it to be within the scope of competence for financial planners and kind of stealing what already works. <laughs> okay, lovely. Thanks so much for sharing that. Um, so I'd love to, I have a bunch of questions I'd love to dive into. There's a, a bunch that are about the sort of um, issues and questions that come up before marriage, which is kind of like the big milestone in people's lives. Uh, and then a bunch I'd love to ask you about sort of post-marriage, um, how some of those uh, issues may shift and how to, you know, just how to handle them in a productive way. So if I, if we just first start on the kind of the pre-marriage bucket, I'd love to just get your thoughts on, you know, when you first start, um, when you first meet and start dating somebody new, what are the questions that you should be asking or the behaviors that you should be observing early on in a relationship to uh, understand your partner's financial values, their financial philosophy, et cetera. Yeah, it's, you know, honestly, so hard to know people's financial behaviors. These so many of it are not secretive, but behind the scenes. And so you might not know how much they make or how much they're spending or if they're living within um, their, I don't know, their, their income, with the, where they should be. And so I think the idea of slowly introducing it into conversations can be really powerful, especially early on. Because the truth of the matter, you know, people always talk about opposites attract. And that's not true. Research has shown over and over again that we actually marry someone very similar to us in our religious views, our political views, like those big identity parts of us. We pick someone similar, except for when it comes to money. Then we're like all of a sudden attracted to our opposite. And so I don't think that's necessarily bad, but just being aware that you might not be seeing their whole money behaviors. They might, you not, might not be aware of them all. Got it. So what are some questions that would be good to ask early on? Yeah, I think things like, um, what are your financial goals? You know, so often when we talk about money, they feel like stressful conversations and I wish people had more positive financial conversation. So what are you saving for? What are the tricks that you've learned that made you save better? What have you bought that brings you joy? What are your short-term and your long-term financial goals? Because what's cool is there's research that shows that creating goals together increases intimacy automatically because all of a sudden your dream of going to Italy one day is not just a dream of going to Italy, it's a dream of going to Italy with your partner. And so the more you have these positive conversations, it gets a taboo-ness around money to go down. And then you can talk about the harder conversations that like student loan debt or credit card debt after you guys already have this great track record of talking about money in a positive light. Yeah, you know, one thing I'm, I'm struck by is um, for folks, especially like earlier on um, in their careers, maybe they're recently out of school, they may not have 
you know, reflected on some of these big questions around, you know, what am I saving for my financial goals? Uh, it might just not be on their radar. It does take, you know, some self-reflection to do that. And um, uh, if there's not something acute that you need right now that, you know, it's like, it's not like the, the most urgent thing um, necessarily. <laughs> and so yeah. if, you, if you ask these questions to somebody early on in a relationship and they don't know, or they're just like, hmm, well, I haven't thought about it. How should, I guess, how should one interpret or address, or is that, that in itself an answer? Yeah. Um, how, how should one, you know, sort of face that? I think you're right that it, that is, in itself is an answer that maybe they haven't been intentional about thinking about their future. But I think even then it's kind of a blessing. Like you might accidentally improve their financial health by having these conversations about like, what are your dreams? What do you want to save up for? You know, we often equate being able to buy stuff as something that'll make us happy. But we know from research, buying things does not make us happy. It is the anticipation of buying things that make us happy. And so if you're able to shift gears and say, you know, I really want, you know, even something that's simple like a new PlayStation and say, uh, my short-term goal is I'm saving up for a PlayStation, that can bring some joy to us because you start thinking of something you're anticipating will bring you joy which actually brings you more joy than actually having it, which is kind of cool. Uh, if, the, if the other person doesn't have an answer to questions that, some of these kind of threshold questions that you ask, um, are there particular behaviors that you would recommend that folks pay attention to? Um, because often actions speak louder than words. Yeah, I think um, if they mention debt and then you see a lot of credit card use, you might want to be a little red flaggy. But you know, the cool thing about money, I think, is that you can shift gears and, and make tremendous changes at any point. And so maybe your partner isn't great with money. Maybe they have been wasting money. But as you guys become more and more committed to one another, you can have conversations and actually shift their relationship with money. And you know, even though I don't condone every uh, piece of advice that Dave Ramsey gives, Dave Ramsey has changed so many people's lives who were in massive amounts of debt and they have managed to clear it up very quickly. And so I want your listeners to understand, even if your partner is a hot mess around finances right now, you can help them. You as a team can work towards goals and make progress that no one is stuck in their relationship with money. We can evolve and change. Got it. Uh, so uh, you know, money-related questions are sensitive. Um, <laughs> people, it, it can be a, a, an emotionally fraught subject. What, what are some tips or advice for the mechanics uh, that you might have uh, when it comes to asking sensitive money-related questions in a way that doesn't provoke a negative reaction by uh, the other person? Yeah, I think my two big pieces of advice are first focusing more on goals rather than problems, because then you can shift the problems into new goals. It's, it's no longer you have a problem with student loan debt, it's a goal to pay off student loan debt. And that makes it a lot easier to talk about. I think also modeling through your own uh, like self-reflection can be really a great way of introducing these conversations. Like here are my financial goals. Here's what I'm struggling around finances with. Can you share with me as well? And, and that way you are starting out and saying, I am, I am, I am able to share. So I'm hoping you'll be able to share too. Got it. Uh, do you have any tips for how to handle it when, if the other person does get defensive or reacts negatively to questions you're asking? Yeah. I'm sure you must've seen this before. <laughs> yeah. I think a goal is, you know, what we talk a lot about is this thing called emotional flooding is that sometimes when you do um, create a defensive response in a partner. What's actually going on is that their hormones have caused their brain to switch to the more um, evolutionary younger part of the brain, the more reactive part of the brain. And so there's no point in continuing. It, it's not one of those times where you should, oh, they're getting defensive, let me hate them or harder. It is, let's take a break, let's stop, let's shift gears, let's calm and like physiologically stop, what we're, you know, calm down. And then we can recircle, you know, recircle back in a couple of days or a couple of hours when you're feeling more calm. I think oftentimes people um, mistakenly believe in the saying, like, you shouldn't go to sleep angry. Mm -hmm. And if you're tired, you're not going to be able to resolve things. Go to sleep. And the next day when you're fed and well rested, you'll be able to communicate in a more efficient way than when you're 
flustered or angry or tired or hungry. Interesting. So feed people and make sure they're well rested. <laughs> you know, that's been the secret to my husband's happiness. <laughs> he needs to be rested. Do you have advice for folks who, you know, chronically run into this problem? Because some people are just like not great at engaging conversationally in some of these hard questions and they can become emotional. Maybe it takes a little bit longer if they're well-fed and rested, but, um, you know, it can still happen. Uh, Any advice for folks like this? Yeah. You know, I think um, if there's a lot of conflict around talking about money, oftentimes I think it has something to do with the way we see money. So if you were to go to an intro level conflict resolution class as a major in some schools, what they would always say is the first step to conflict resolution is to make sure there's goal consensus and problem consensus. Because oftentimes we're actually fighting about two different things or trying to get to two different endpoints. And so oftentimes money is symbolically meaning something different. Jeffrey Dew calls it hidden, the hidden secrets of money. So for some of us, money is power, some of us money is security, some of us money is safety, some of us money is fun. And so figuring out what your partner is actually um, uh, thinking around money is can make you guys be more on the same page about what are you actually talking about. Uh, got it. Cool. So if I'm just sort of synthesizing the um, um, our discussion just now, then it sounds like a good set of uh, skills to bring to the table, framing issues more in terms of goals rather than problems, making sure folks are uh, well fed and rested, and um, uh, making sure you have consensus on on problem statements and goal statements. Is that an accurate summary? I love that. I think those three it would make my job non-existent. I think the fourth thing I, I didn't highlight enough is that we really do come with these different lenses around money. You know, I call them uh, Jeffrey Jew's language about the hidden issues about money, but. There's another group of researchers named um, Brad and Ted Klontz and Rick Kaler that had created this thing called money scripts. And they said, some people are money avoidant, some people are money status, some people are money worshipers, and some people are money vigilant. And we learned those scripts so young that we're unable to recognize that other people see money differently. And so when we're talking about money, like let's say, let's give the whole spender saver thing, right? The spender is talking to their partner and saying, I want freedom. I want power in a relationship. I want to be able to make decisions about my money. And the saver is saying, I'm scared of the future. I'm scared where the money is going. I'm scared that we're not going to have enough. And so these two people are never recognizing that when they say, I don't want you to buy that purse, that they're actually saying, I'm afraid of our future or I need power in our relationship. And if you could say those underlying meanings and oh, a lot of our problems would go away. That's really interesting. How do you bring those to the surface? Yeah, so the you know the one I wish everybody would do is actually take a money script inventory. And so the uh, money script inventory is also, uh, also called the Klontz money script inventory. You can Google it and find ways to take it online. And it simply outlines these beliefs that are partially true, but maybe guiding your behavior accidentally. Like I had something in my money script that was like, money is not important, that there's bigger things in the world you should care about, which is fine, except for when you push down any focus on money, because you need to have a, you know, a safe, healthy financial setting to do anything else. So my belief that money was somehow bad prevented me from, you know, tracking my spending or being intentional or saving. And so once you recognize, oh, I do 100% buy into that script, then you can start to say, well, that's not always true. That doesn't necessarily have to be true. And it's kind of freeing. So I definitely just being aware of these money beliefs can be really powerful. God, is this just to make sure I understand because I'm outside of this world. Is, it, is this like a, like a questionnaire that somebody fills out and then it spits yeah. out like a result? Right. Yes. It's very much like Buzz, BuzzFeed or whatever that's called, where you can take all the little surveys. Um, and I think I've seen it on several websites. A lot of wonderful practitioners have it on their website as a way of recruiting clients. You can take it back. Or I think um, Brad Klontz has it available online. Or your listeners are welcome to email me as well. I'm sure you'll have my contact information somewhere and I can send it to them. Got it. Perfect. Um, I was, you know, I was, when you were describing um, this money script exercise, it, it was, I was thinking back to, you know, like in a prior career that I had where 
uh, I was working in like product design and there's like this, um, uh, this type of structured design brainstorming thinking process that <clears throat> product designers will uh, often go through to try to um, keep like uh, sort of negative reactions or emotions or judgments at bay. And so it might look something like um, everybody quietly brainstorming first and then putting ideas on the board and then you know ranking them uh, like individually voting. Um, so you're trying to get ideas out before you start going to, you know, you move to the judgment phase uh, and that kind of helps separate out um, ideation where people can kind of freely come up with as many ideas, even the bad ones, because there's often some good ones in there before they move to um, like the evaluation phase. And I was just curious, and when it comes to money conversations with people, are there these similar types of uh, exercises that you find to be particularly effective, maybe that you will sometimes um, walk clients through? Maybe it's this money script inventory. I was curious oh. if there are other things that even folks can do on their own, knowing that without a mediator or moderator, then they may have to be, either the, the exercise may have to be very structured or they may have to be very uh, sort of mindful about how it's done. Right, yeah. So there's this great worksheet that was developed by Prepare, it's a premarital program. That sounds exactly like what you were just describing. What it does first, and people listening can do this with their partner without a mediator, but on a piece of paper, you have to first write down, what are you guys actually fighting about? And both people have to agree with that. And the next step is to, just start off by saying, I contribute to the problem by blank. And just name one thing that even if, it, even if it's 90% your partner's fault, what's the 10% that maybe you are playing a part in the conflict? And so that way both people will start out lovingly and say, I know I could do better in this one area. So let's work together and we'll figure it out. And then what you do is you brainstorm 10 solutions to the conflict, right? You just write down all these ideas. And like you said, so many of them are going to be garbage, <laughs> like ideas that like you would never use, but there might be some piece of a couple that you can put together for the real solution. And then you decide on, you know, the pros and cons of all of those. Uh, I did this once with a couple, speaking of garbage, and they were fighting a lot about who took out the garbage. And really what they're fighting about is household tasks, you know, like who's doing more. But during their solutions, they actually came up with one that he had one of those windows flying things called a drone. And they were going to have the drone <laughs> take out the trash, <laughs> which would have been a massive mess. But like, it also made them laugh and made them take a step back and calm down. And I think that's the beauty of, of using paper or using something else. It kind of decreases that physiological arousal that I was talking about earlier. I think- you Got it. Yeah. One other thing I do recommend is having a conversation when you get serious with your partner about your parents' relationship around me. What did you love about it? What did you wish was different? What was the greatest thing they taught you about money? What are things that they, they taught you about money you wish you didn't do? And then you can kind of take the best of both your families and move forward with something beautiful. Got it. Uh, cool. That, so the, this worksheet that you have, is there a link that maybe you can send me out? I'll link to it in the show notes. Is Ooh, there a... You know what? I'll make a version of it. It's actually through an organization called Prepare Enrich. I don't know if I'm allowed to share it, but I can uh, kind of give that talking points and then people can create their own worksheet. And again, the real goal is to have the goal consensus. How do we both contribute? And then 10 possible solutions. Got it. Okay, great. So you know, given that money can be so sensitive and uh, emotional and crazy making uh, and difficult to talk about, any advice on how to like even attract a partner in the first place who shares similar financial values as you? You know, I don't know if it's good to have the same values. There might be some beauty in the fact that we select our opposite as long as you guys can move closer together and respect each other's perspective. I think the problem with couples when we're opposites is we tend to otherize each other. Like he's the spender, I'm the saver. And what happens is this thing that people call polarization where we push each other to extremes. Like a good, another example outside of money is that I'm a talker, <laughs> I like to talk, but my husband is too. But whenever people ask him if he's extroverted or introverted, he sometimes says he's introverted because he's comparing himself to me. Whereas if he had married someone who wasn't as loud as me, <laughs> he probably would see himself as an extrovert. And so when you think about your relationship with your partner, 
and you say, oh, we're slightly different about money, don't polarize and say, oh, they're so different than me because they're probably not, you know, respect that, you know, you guys are balancing each other rather than that you guys are extremely different. Um, but I, of course, if you marry, if you are really respectful of money, it's a lot easier to marry someone who's very respectful of money too. So I wish that on everybody too. <laughs> okay, got it. Um, so on that note, I'm just curious, like, suppose you meet someone you really like, they're a great companion, you think they're the one, but you have very different mindsets and behaviors when it comes to money, um, you know, to the point where it actually creates conflict, kind of like not the balance, but actually creates conflict. Mm -hmm. Realistically, how, like, how realistic is it to change these things about a person? How do you do it? And if you can't, what advice would you have for folks in this situation? Yeah, I think, like I said earlier, I think money is one of those beautiful things that is changeable. It's not like um, detail oriented versus, um, you know, messy. It's not something that I think is intrinsically personality. Of course, like a spender is not going to become a saver overnight, but I think you can create rules for each other that you both agree in, especially if the person creates their own rules that is overt for the couples, your accountability partners. I think there can be a lot of strength in a relationship, again, when people are different. I think when it's causing conflict, again, the, the important thing is to keep on talking about it because um, you know a lot of us think that fights are bad and it's a sign the relationship's ending. And that's absolutely not true at all. In fact, a good fight gives you new insights on how to take care of your partner, what your partner needs that you would never get if you didn't fight. You know, there's this amazing researcher named John Gottman who has a love lab, that's what he calls it in Seattle, and he studies thousands and thousands and thousands of couples, right? He studies so many couples, he can reject rates of divorce from two minutes of conversation. Isn't that mind boggling? But he says there's this something called a golden ratio with couples where fights are fine, but for every one fight, one negative interaction you have, you have to have five positive interactions. So you can fight 10 times a day and it's fine if you have 50 wonderful, you know, positive experiences. You can only have one fight a day and be in a terrible shape if you're only having about four positive experiences. So finding ways to talk about money, maybe over wine, maybe with music on, maybe with, again, goals in mind, something that makes it less heavy, less um, argumentative so that you guys can gain skills in talking about money where it's not immediately associated with conflict is really the goal rather than getting rid of the conflict. And is it just using the, some of the same um, techniques and tools that we talked about earlier, or are there uh, additional ones that folks in the you know, particularly difficult situation of like a partner who's recalcitrant and unlikely to change? Yeah. Uh, Cause at some level, I agree that some, you know, you can change at some level though, people cannot. There is a probably a, a line over which they just cannot go is just inherent whether it's innate or they were, you know, they became that way, it can be hard to change folks um, uh, when you're in this scenario, but you really like the person or love the person. Are, are there any additional tools that folks should keep in mind for how to handle yeah. these situations? Well, I think another, like, um, again, going back to John Gottman, if you're in a relationship where there's a lot of conflict, John Gottman's website has a lot of great resources on communication skills. You know, it's not really money per se that is the problem most likely, it is the communication around money. So if you can do things like say I statements where you say, mm -hmm. I feel hurt that you're spending so much money rather than why do you waste so much money? That's a very big, powerful change. Another huge um, basic skill to improve your ability to communicate about these issues is that you have to focus on making complaints that are about a specific action or, or, or behavior they're doing rather than criticizing who they are. Mm -hmm. It is not that you're wasteful and not paying attention to money. It's that you spent uh, $30 on a purse and we are so tight on money right now. You see how one is an action and one is a it is a personality. You can change behaviors, you can't change personalities. So I think those are two just great communication skills. And then again, seeking to understand, asking questions rather than mind reading. Like uh, there's a really common cognitive bias called actor observer bias. Have you heard this before? Okay, so actor observer bias means when we do something, we recognize all the environmental factors that led to the behavior. 
But when someone else does that, then we just say, oh, that's because of their personality. So if I'm tailgating, which happens occasionally, it's because I'm running late and I hope people recognize I'm worried about my kids like being left alone and pick up. And I think about all the things leading to me to tailgate. But as soon as someone tailgates on me, I'm like, why did your mother raise you so poorly? Like it's immediately they're a bad person. Not that they could be running away for their kids. That can never be the fact. And we do this with our partners. We we really do this thing where we're like, that is their personality and say, instead of saying, what were the factors that led them to act this way? Yeah, that's really good advice. I think focusing on um, observable actions rather than identity characteristics right. is, is is super powerful in changing the tone and the product product like how productive the conversation is uh, yeah. def definitely agree with that 